was rather an unsettled baby when he was born, had a, a bit of a traumatic delivery. Um, he was first in hospital when he was seven weeks old. We spent a lot of time going to and from doctors and speaking to health visitors and he developed RSV type power influenza on his lungs which wasn't clearing up with antibiotics so when that wasn't clearing up they started looking at his blood counts and that's when they found out they didn't have any immunity cells, no white cells. Because of the need for sufferers of Christopher's condition to be kept in isolation, the illness came to be known in the media as the Bubble Boy disease. But this is Christopher now. Thanks to his therapy, Christopher is now halfway to having a full immune system and is able to live life like any other child. He is now a healthy, happy boy, who this year celebrated his 10th birthday, cured of the genetic illness that could have killed him. But it hasn't been an easy journey coming to this stage, both for him and his family and for gene therapy's development. But what exactly is gene therapy? I asked the doctor who led Christopher's therapy, Professor Adrian Thrasher, who's one of the nation's foremost experts on gene therapy and immunology at the Institute of Child Health in London. Gene therapy is a way of using our knowledge of the genes to formulate new medicines. So using the genetic code to um, construct molecules that we can put into cells for various therapeutic effects. Usually we treat these patients by bone marrow transplants, which is very effective if they have a, a good donor. Okay, so ideally a brother or sister is perfect. The point is that um, often those uh, matches aren't available for children, so you have to find an alternative, and often we resort to half match, so a parental transplant. Now that's risky because it's only half matched. There are complications associated with the drugs that we need to make it work. Uh, and also because it's, it's a foreign material, so it can induce a, a condition called graft versus host disease. So conventional mm. transplantation in the mismatch setting is, is a risky procedure. But in the 1970s, bone marrow transplant was the only option available for David Vetter, a boy who had the same condition as Christopher. David lived inside a sterile, airtight bubble to keep him safe from infection until a bone marrow transplant could be performed using his sister, Catherine, as a donor. But they weren't a good match, and so David lived for 12 years inside the bubble, where he was baptised, educated, where he read and watched television, separated from the outside world by these plastic walls. But finally, it was decided that a bone marrow transplant should be performed using his sister as the donor. But after a few months, David became sick for the first time in his life. He eventually slipped into a coma and died aged 12 on the 22nd of February 1984. It was the first and only time his mother had been able to touch his skin. Had gene therapy been available for David, he might have lived. Um, severe combined immune deficiency, otherwise otherwise known as skid or uh, in the media known as bubble boy disease is a very one of the most severe immunodeficiencies that we know about where children are born without any effective immune system so it's a very serious disease because if they pick up even trivial viral infections uh, they can succumb very quickly our genes are what make us who we are they define all our features but in Christopher's case, one of the sequences in his DNA meant that it would be very easy for him to catch illnesses that other people's immune systems would block out. What we have devised is, is a way of treating his own bone marrow using genetic medicines to try and correct the um, deficiency. Christopher had what is called somatic gene therapy, where the doctors at Great Ormond Street took a small amount of bone marrow from Christopher's body and then altered the DNA it contained. They repaired the sequence that controls the immune system and then put this sequence back into Christopher's body where his other cells began copying the new DNA, thus curing his immunodeficiency. 
gene therapy is now entering its second phase of trials, but although the therapy itself is relatively cheap and the majority of funding for it comes from central government, gene therapy research is still heavily dependent on charitable groups such as Genes for Genes. So Genes for Genes is the national UK children's charity that raises funds for children with genetic disorders. Um, the main way that we do this is through our uh, main fundraising day, Genes for Genes Day, which is always on the first Friday in October, where we ask schools, nursery schools, workplaces to come to work or school in genes and make a small donation. Roughly 1 in 25 children are born with a genetic condition, um, so that sort of equates to roughly one, one child in every classroom, if you think about it in terms of in those terms. So you know, it's incredibly important um, uh, for you know, us to raise funds um, for them and, and try and help them in any which way we can. But in 2007, gene therapy suffered a serious setback when four of the nine children successfully given gene therapy in Paris developed leukaemia. And then in 2008, a boy treated at Great Auburn Street also developed the cancer. Christopher's parents were shocked by the news. One hell of a shock, yes. It was a phone call we were dreading because we knew what happened in Paris, what happened there. But we knew the doctors at Great Ormond Street were keeping a very close eye on it. I mean, Christopher now goes every six months. So that should the worst case scenario happen, they can spot it straight away and know how to treat it. But as it stands, there's no fatalities with gene therapy. So, But yeah, earth shattering at the time. The problem is, is that the switches within the, in the medicine not only switch on the therapeutic gene, but it can also switch on other genes within the cell, the host genes. That sometimes the genetic medicines can turn on uh, genes within the cell that turn the cell into a, a cancer cell or a leukaemia type cell. Uh, now obviously that's undesirable, it has happened in a few children. Um, so, so we, we also understand that if we control that switch in a more sophisticated way, that we can switch on the therapeutic gene without um, touching any of the other genes in the cell. And so the new trials should be much safer. With the help of charities and other financial supporters, gene therapy is continuing to break new ground. And although the risk of leukaemia can't be ruled out completely, there have been as yet no fatalities caused by the therapy side effects. The spectrum of conditions that can be treated is expanding. Um, from the technological point of view, the uh, genetic medicines are more effective and they're almost certainly safer. So despite the risk of leukaemia, gene therapy is generally seen as a great success and it's now being used to help treat a huge variety of conditions such as sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis and melanoma and it may even be effective in treating cancer and HIV. It's um, a pioneer, <laughs> a medical pioneer. Something up, you know, without the doctors um, and without the people behind the scenes that have done all this research, um, you know, it's, changed, it's saved Christopher's life, it's changed Christopher's life. He's not had to have the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy. You know, it's his own bone marrow going, going in, um, and whilst his immune system's not fully recovered, you know, he's well enough to do clubs, he's well enough to go in school, he's well enough to lead pretty much a normal life. So we're going to look back to that diagnosis to where we are now. Yes, thank you, God. <laughs> really.